Well, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Chatham House. My name is Rosalind Marsden, and I'm an associate fellow attached to the a Africa program <coughs> here at Chatham House. Um, before we start the event, I just wanted to let you all know that, that it will be on the record, um, and the event will also be live streamed. And if I could just ask you also just to make sure your phones are on silent. So, uh, we are really delighted to be holding this discussion at such a historic moment for Sudan. And I would like to start uh, by extending my congratulations to the Sudanese people for the courage and resilience that they've shown in achieving this revolution. Building, of course, on the struggle that has been going on in the conflict zones of Sudan in Darfur, the Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile for many years. After 30 years of rule by Omar al-Bashir, um, he was finally removed from office by the military on the 11th of April as a result of popular pressure following four months of nationwide peaceful protests. The uh, protesters in Sudan want to see an immediate transition to democratic civilian rule. Negotiations have been underway uh, <clears throat> over the last week or so uh, between the Transitional Military Council, which is currently headed by General Abdel Fateh Burhan, and the Forces for Freedom and Change, which is a coalition of opposition forces of the Sudanese Professionals Association and other civil society organizations principally over the structure and composition of a civilian-led transitional administration. But these negotiations uh, currently appear to be deadlocked over the question of whether the Transitional Military Council will agree to hand over real power to civilians. So the future of the country uh, still remains uncertain, and a lot of challenges remain particularly given the fact that over the last 30 years, a deep state has been put in place in all the state institutions. Um, as far as the regional and international dynamics are concerned, uh, the African Union has demanded that the Transitional Military Council should step aside and hand over power to a civilian-led authority within 60 days. This deadline was originally 15 days, there was then a recommendation from African leaders in meeting in Egypt that it should be th extended to three months, and then last night, the African Union Peace and Security Council decided on 60 days. <coughs> Western governments are also pressing for a swift transition to civilian-led government, but some of the Gulf states and Egypt are supporting the Transitional Military Council. So the, there are still uh, a lot of challenges and there's still quite a way to go before the objectives of the revolution are achieved. Now, um, I'm delighted that today we will be joined by six Sudanese speakers um, who will uh, give their reflections on next steps in this transitional process and how we've decided to use the two hours that we have available is first of all to start with a panel of three speakers who will focus principally on the political dynamics in Sudan, and then a second panel who will focus on the socio-economic context. And we've asked each of our six speakers to present for no more than seven minutes so that we will have plenty of time for uh, a question and answer session. Um, so um, in the, f in the uh, first panel, I would like to introduce our three uh, speakers, starting with Dr. Sarah Ibrahim Abdul-Jalil, on the far right, <clears throat> who is a paediatric consultant, um, also president of the Sudan Doctors' Union in the UK, and a member of the Sudanese Professionals Association, which has played a very leading role in the organization of the protest movement. As president of the Sudanese Doctors' Union in the UK, uh, Dr. Abdul-Jalil has campaigned for the role of Sudanese graduates in activating legitimate unions and the role of professionals in democratic change. And she's an avid campaigner for development and healthcare 
as a basic human right. Um, our second speaker um, on my right, Abdul Malik El Obeid, is the head of the UK branch of the Sudanese Communist Party. And his engagement with the party dates back to 1971. And he has maintained an interest in the dynamics of political and social transformation in Sudan. Abdul Malik came to the UK from Sudan in 1990 on a British Council scholarship to do a master's degree at Aston University in Birmingham. And he has worked in teaching and community development in both Sudan and the UK. The third speaker in this panel on my left, Ali Abdul Latif, is currently uh, the uh, representative in the UK of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement North, a GAR faction, um, and also a, lead, uh, a member of the Sudan Call Opposition Alliance. Uh, Ali Abdul Latif has spent a large part of his life in the UK where he has both studied and worked. He taught media studies uh, at Hall Place TV and Film Studios and at the Northern Film School at Leeds Metropolitan University. And he's also worked as education and media curriculum coordinator for Leeds schools. So um, at, at this point, I, perhaps I could invite um, Dr. Sarah Abdul-Jalil to lead off with a short introductory presentation, Dr. Sarah. And good evening. Um, uh, on behalf of the Sudan Doctors' Union, UK uh, would like to thank the organizers for um, this uh, event, which is very timely, meeting with the situation in Sudan. So the Sudan Doctors' Union uh, branch was established in the 70s. Uh, our mother uh, body is based in Sudan, and we have always been closely linked to our colleagues. Um, First of all, we, are, we obviously look after our members in the UK, but we have been always campaigning for better health services in Sudan and better training for our colleagues there. We do believe that in the last 30 years, um, there has been a significant uh, collapse in the service, and what is delivered at, at the moment is violation of human rights in the absence of uh, basic uh, health care. Um, as well, uh, we have been involved in uh, Sudan Doctor Strike and uh, supporting and being the voice of our colleagues and um, as well reporting casualties and injuries because our um, doctors are the front line, they are the ones who will treat these uh, injuries and these casualties and therefore our reports have been uh, very important to um, you know, raise uh, concerns and as, as well expose the facts about what's happening uh, in Sudan. Uh, we are representing through the Sudan Doctors' Union in the uh, Sudan Professional Association, and we have been supporting the Sudan Professional Association being unionists and professionals, uh, because we feel that there is a major role for professionals uh, alongside politicians and civil societies in making change in Sudan. And this is not new, and it is not um, something which is um, ad hoc. Always Sudan professionals have played a major role in democracy change in the 60s and in the 80s. Um, however, it has been very difficult for my colleagues back home because there's a lot of austerity measures, uh, detention, they have been killed uh, in torture, they have been uh, dismissed from work, and therefore our role outside Sudan as part of the Sudanese diaspora has been um, you know, very uh, important. We do support the Declaration of Freedom and Change, the three objectives and the nine steps. Uh, we do believe that the first objective has not been achieved. Uh, still, there has been no uh, step down and handover of the power uh, con uh, unconditionally and peacefully. We believe that the military council is an extension of the same regime, and therefore uh, the declaration of freedom and change, we have not even moved to step or to objective two, which is the uh, civilian uh, government establishment. Uh, while we are awaiting this, uh, or awaiting that we will move uh, swiftly to the civilian uh, government, um, we have been working in organizing the alternative health policies. And that has been going in the last 10 years, that people have been doctors thinking about what are the alternative you know, health policies when you know, health, you know, we, we move towards transitional uh, government. So we are prepared. We have an emergency plan that has been endorsed by doctors uh, globally from Sudan and outside Sudan. And that was held in uh, the UK in London early um, in, in April. So we, we are very uh, proud of the work that has been done by my colleague. 
we, we, we believe that the international community and policymakers, stakeholders, and uh, media, have got, they have a, a, a major role at this uh, point of time, um, stressing the importance that the legitimate uh, request of the people of Sudan uh, must be achieved. Uh, there is no regime at the moment. The regime lost its mandate, and therefore um, the movement toward the civilian government uh, should be facilitated and be supported, uh, because we don't want that to be prolonged, and we don't want um, uh, at the end for people after all of this uh, effort to go back to square one uh, to the same regime that um, is just coming with new faces in a recycling uh, process. Uh, the request about a uh, state council that represent the civilian with representation of the uh, armed forces and the that I think it's um, um, a reasonable request, and that the army forces should go back and do what is requested from them as an independent institute regarding security, but not to lead the transitional period. Um, I would like to say that it has been a long journey, um, and it has never been uh, an easy uh, thing to arrive um, in what happened in December. It, it's a cumulative effect of ongoing resistance in Sudan, where thousands died, uh, sadly. We feel like we are in an aeroplane and we can see our destination, but we can't land because there, there is turbulence. And unless this turbulence, we, we move through this turbulence, we cannot um, land safely. So the journey uh, is at its end, but we are not yet there. Um, I won't speak um, anymore because of the time. So we have hope and fear, but we are proud of what we have done so far. And, um, I will just say that um, revolution continues. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sarah. Um, Abdul Malik Abbebeid, would you like to uh, yeah, okay. follow up? Uh, first of all, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and thanks to Chatham House and the administration for inviting us to talk about Sudan. I will start the political dynamics in Sudan as a heading with just a brief in background for, for those who are not familiar with Sudan and the current regime. Um, the National Islamic Front uh, waged a, a military coup in uh, 1989, um, putting an end to a democratically elect elected government. Um, it uh, happened at the time when really um, a, a leader, um, Muhammad Osman Marani and John Garang, late John Garang, were about to meet and settle all the kind of uh, wars and problems between North and South. Uh, the, the coup actually interrupted this kind of putting an end to democracy and putting also an end to a peaceful kind of amicable solution between South and North. So from the outset, the, the NIF, that's the National Islamic Front regime, monopolized all political, economic life in Sudan. But first of all, uh, banning all par political parties, banning all trade unions, banning all sort of uh, um, organization and, and uh, political expression of any sort in Sudan. So the leading to the dictatorship, I cannot actually, according to time limitation, cannot go on about all the shortcomings and problems of that regime, but it ends up with a, an absolute dictatorship and a corrupt, corrupt state and a failing state as well. Um, the Leaping from that background, just coming straight to the current situation, which is now started actually with the uh, political and economic uh, crisis starting. For the political crisis, it started from the outset of a, 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 1989. That's a political uh, crisis. And then this roll on and over to a kind of different types of crises. And one of them is the, the latest one, which is the economic one, which brought all Sudanese people to a kind of uh, December uprising. 
So December uprising started with a kind of, uh, it's due to the accumulation of all these kinds of injustices, all those kind of corrupt regime, all sorts of uh, monopoly of political decisions and everything. Then um, before the revolution or the uprising reached its end, and as usual, some kind of military groups, and I do share my predecessor, uh, Dr. Um, Sarah, in saying that the group that took over are not different from the regime that we deposed. It's the same, the same people, the same people, and most of them are, are wanted and indict and are suspects to the ICC, the International Crim Criminal Court. So the, why the military uh, uh, council uh, jumped into the middle and took power, it is, for me, it is generally to protect their colleagues. This is one, and to protect themselves at the same time. So it is actually to stop or to put an end to the revolution. That is the main goal. And it has appeared in so many things, despite doing here and there to please the people and to stop the protest. But in essence, of all we can see now, they are actually aiming to restore the regime, the last regime, yes, which was driven out of the door. They wanted to come back through the window. So uh, what's the nature of the struggle between the military and military council the, and the Alliance of Freedom and Change. In reality, the military council claimed from the beginning that they're not in, in pursuit of power. But the negotiation with, with the group of the alliance or the delegates shows clearly that they want to hold power. They're not as they say, they're not in, uh, interested in power. And their claims are not really genuine. They're talking about doing justice, and doing justice to whom? Uh, if the freedom and change, all those groups are the groups that are responsible for moving people and also for speaking on behalf of the Sudanese people, who the other people they want to uh, to uh, defend their rights. I think that's, that's not uh, right. So the regime politically actually involved the Sudan in lots of things, particularly the pact, and so I'm jumping actually because of time limitation, to the main thing, I think the most, most important hindrance at the moment for the revolution to go forward is actually uh, not only the internal forces, but also external forces that are partly mainly Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia and Emirates. These are two factors that are interested in keeping the military in power because for their interests, and they have different interests, but generally they are united under that thing. And I think um, the way out, we, I cannot go on because I think it's, my time is over. Uh, I put actually a way out and put some suggestions. Um, I'll handle them through the questions if that is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so, Ali Abdel Latif. Uh, yes, um, um, good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you, Rosalind, for the opportunity for addressing this audience and to Chatham House for uh, the invitation. Um, uh, we in the SPLM, I think. I just want to be clear that we've got very little time, so I decided that we'll focus, I'll focus my speech on a few points that hopefully we will be able to unpick during the discussion. Um, so we in the SPLM have made it very clear since 2012 that in the event of the overthrow of the regime by a popular uprising, we will lay down our weapons. A civilian government which genuinely, which genuinely reflects the political spectrum within the opposition is bound to be sympathetic to call for ending wars and the causes of war in Sudan. We do not have a civilian government as yet, but it is clear 
that, that peace is one of the key three demands of the revolution, the others being freedom and justice. The current situation presents a historical opportunity to finally close the chapter on the destructive legacy of endless civil wars in Sudan that has plagued the country since independence, and to set about addressing the deep-seated causes which feed political and ethnic violence. This is not true for us in our faction of the SBLM alone, but also true for our allies and partners in other armed groups. Armed resistance was not a method of choice for the struggle, but it was imposed by successive regimes on the marginalized areas of Sudan. This optimism about the future uh, as a result of what happened recently, and not just based on the clamor of young protesters uh, calling for peace, it rests also on the willingness, particularly of regional partners, to push and urge for a settlement. The fact that al-Bashir has gone has removed a major obstacle for peace. So far, there are encouraging signals from the Military Council. Their acceptance for the declaration of freedom and change as, as a basis for a common agenda for change in Sudan opened up the way for armed groups to take part in shaping the transitional period. The declaration third item specifically states to work towards security arrangements as, at, at an end, as an end point to a just and comprehensive peace. The Declaration of Freedom and Change presents also the best starting point for peace in Sudan in a long time. This may somehow get muddied by the push and pull between the forces, forces, in, forces for Change and the Military Council concerning the power transfer to a civilian administration. They were promised. The main political alliance which has led the revolution includes several armed resistance movements but there are also armed groups and political formations outside the Alliance for Freedom and Change, which have also contributed in the revolution, as did indeed some of members of the Military Council. Therefore, the prospect for a partnership between all these forces, leading to an orderly and still peaceful transfer of power, is real. We are aware of the awesome responsibility placed upon those, those forces uh, to come together and proceed lockstep in the, during the transitional period. Without this unity and, and common cause, I am sure none of the aspirations of the, and the demands of the revolution will be re realized. This partnership should be based on a principal stand on two key requirements for a successful transition and a future consolidation of democracy. First, the disbanding and liquidation of the Islamic State left behind by al-Bashir. And second, a just constitutional settlement for the war-torn regions of Sudan, that's Darfur, Blue Nile, and, and, and Nuba Mountain, to end wars and the causes of wars. It is my view that the sit-in and the mass mobilization every week, every, every week is sufficient pressure, not only to dis discipline in the conduct of the military council, but also impelling political parties and armed groups to find commonalities and be guided by the unity already achieved by ordinary people during the course of this revolution. I believe it is too early to speak about the African Union mediation. The political climate following the overthrow of al-Bashir after 11th of April has changed completely, and a new one is taking shape. It is, right, it is right to allow the new emerging configuration to take shape and to allow the pressure from below to play out its full impact. The same goes for the international community. And if they are to play a full and positive role, they should consult closely with forces of freedom and change. However, if the international community is to have a role at present, it would be to exert pressure on the military council on the question of the transfer of power to a civilian government. We in the SPLM, Agar, are grateful for the positive role played by South Sudan in reuniting in the effort of reuniting the two factions of the SPLM. This, I believe, will also strengthen the prospect for a lasting peace and enhance hope for an inclusive democratic future. The struggle for democratic change and for a lasting, and for a lasting peace has to be treated in one, as one package, achieving a genuine inclusive democratic political order, and, and possible, which, is, which isn't possible without 
equal citizenship and the end to social and economic marginalization. Inclusive also means that Islamism, Islamism as a cultural and political current should be accorded a space in the new society. So as long as they accept, so long as they accept to play by the rules and reconcile themselves to this new democratic order. After 30 years of dictatorship, the country should be given the opportunity to build a resilient institutions that would support democratic change. It is right that the transitional period should be at least four years. We must be careful not to repeat the mistakes of those countries that rushed into elections ended up and ended up breathing the whirlwind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed to our three speakers for those introductory remarks. And now I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, could I ask you if you'd like to ask a question, if you could uh, just give your name and affiliation. Um, and uh, a microphone will be, will be brought round. Uh, I think we have a speaker. We have a question over here. <clears throat> yeah. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a Chatham House member. I've also worked on um, trade enhancement programs in Aqaba and briefly in Puntland. And my question really is about, um, let's be brutally frank about it, great power competition and interests in Sudan. Um, whom are you prepared to compromise with in order to get non-democratic but powerful regional and world powers to cooperate with you and to accept um, civilian-led or civilian-prominent governments? I'm thinking particularly in relation to Suakin and Port Sudan, because there's plenty of people who are prepared to accept soldiers in power forever, as long as they don't ask many awkward questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take two more questions. Um, this lady here. Thank you. Um, thank you. My name is Mary Rayner. I'm a human rights researcher. Um, there was a lot of very startling footage during the period of the attempt to crush the movement that you've been referring to, uh, and a particular targeting of doctors who had documented injuries and uh, other evidence of unlawful use of force. Um, is there any future role for these uh, um, observers, expert observers, and brave individuals to be part of a justice process, in other words, a criminal accountability for some of the incidents they documented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lady here. Thank you. Yes. Imam Baldwar, independent researcher. Uh, the last speaker talked about the international community in a capacity to consult with the forces to, to negotiate on the ground about what is going on in the impasse that we're seeing now. Is there any kind of program between the people who are now negotiating with the military council with regards, for example, to the Khartoum process because the Troika and the international community, especially the UK, without the Brexit now in an end in sight, is there any program whereby people would like to have the Troika and the EU doing something about Himeti, the person who told the negotiator that he doesn't have to participate because he is paid by an external party, now the sovereignty of the country is at stake. So Himeti now is now the second person for two days within Sea Burhan. And there is a paper given to the All Parliamentary Committee for Sudan regarding the Khartoum process and all its problematic human rights abuses. And it said that you need to have dialogue with the diaspora. As a diaspora and as people who have been here well established in the country, have you ever had any approach made to you by the UK or the Troika about anything to do with the Khartoum process? Right, thank you very much. Um, well, perhaps I could ask Sarah to tackle the second question about doctors yeah. um, and their role in possible future justice processes. And then perhaps I could um, ask uh, Abdul Malik and Ali Abdul Latif if they could comment on the first and third questions. 
<laughs> okay. Um, the cartoon process. Would you be able to tackle the first one? But, uh, well, I, uh, I was actually hoping uh, Abdul Malik, <laughs> 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 because we we actually are not part of the internal uh, negotiations that was going on in, in, in inside the the country. But in terms of the whether the diaspora had been consulted, I I I don't think so. On the cartoon process, but but it's been very opaque and, and uh, the process and um, and the question that we've asked, we had little um, um, clear information as to what's going on, who's been funded, who's who hasn't been funded, what are the benchmark for you know for kind of funding all these people. Um, there are lots of questions that we couldn't find answer to, but uh, but that's I think how how the cartoon press process has been conducted. Um, okay. Well, before, perhaps before we turn to perhaps Dr. Sarah, I could ask you perhaps to ask the, answer the question about doctors, and then yeah. Abdul Malik, if you could perhaps think of what you'd like to say about the sort of regional and international community's role. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, regard to the second question, um, definitely um, in the nine steps in the Declaration of Freedom and Change, uh, transitional justice is an important aspect, not only for what happened during December, but what happened in the last 30 years. Um, in regards to um, documentation, we have uh, good documentation about these cases, um, and we have participated with the London School of Hygiene. I don't know if any of the members are here. In a, um, there is a, an article that's going to be published either this week or next week, and there's about 117 sadly lost their, um, their life. So uh, working together with lawyers and legal advisors, yes, um, investigation, transitional justice, reconciliation and rehabilitation must be part of this process because obviously there has been a lot of um, casualties and injuries and thousands of them so we will have to be uh, realistic about what we can achieve I hope that's okay thank you okay um, it's, a, it's a very difficult question of course but um, uh, the role of the international community as we have experienced here is uh, first started, we started calling for actually saving the, uh, our people against genocide in Darfur and were able actually to get help and place some troops in Darfur to protect civilians there. That's part of a positive intervention. Uh, despite uh, not being very effective, but it is something to stop in, in a way this one. Uh, in terms of the Troika and uh, the EU and the international community as a whole, uh, I, I do believe that the international community has not taken our problem seriously. It has not been dealt with as it should be dealt with in, in the sense that uh, at the beginning, people believe that the regime was so strong and there is no opposition as a whole. And this is why it encourages most Europeans and America as well to have a kind of dealing with, with the regime. Although we know most of them believe that they do not support military coup, and that's a military coup at the beginning, but they started dealing with it. And recently, uh, I think Europe also uh, in relation to your question regarding Hibeti, he was armed, actually, by the help and the money finance from the European community. And we have to be very honest about that. That was a mistake. And the European community uh, can have to apologize for that. That's a mistake. You cannot give a criminal, a criminal, a, somebody accused of genocide, to be given the right to curtail people. What he did, actually, is, is an, and if you take it seriously, it defeats the goal because the, the real reason for the influx of migrants into Europe is actually these brutal regimes in Africa. And so you cannot support them by doing this. What you do is actually support the struggle of the people in this to get rid of these dictators. That is the right way to help both sides develop their own countries and at the same time uh, you get rid of, well, nobody wants uh, to come to this country. If uh, You can see, you look at the journey. I work as an interpreter in Kent, and I've seen and I've heard so many horrific stories of people trying to cross. It's something becoming like death, life and death for them. And I think giving a criminal like Hemeti money 
or armed him is actually putting the Sudan now at, at very, very great risk. And I think it is it's high time for Europeans as well to try to help rectify this situation. This man has to be arrested. And I'm sure he and his, his uh, chair or president, they, they're both involved in genocide. And they're both supposed to be in Lahai. So they should be in the ICC, both of them. So, uh, but it's still, uh, I can say, the British, we had three meetings with the special envoy. And I think the British government has started to change their policies. They stopped their strategic dialogue. And that's, that's something very good, very positive. They asked the ambassador to come, and they told them that they have to hand over the government to civilians, and that's also very positive. And I think the position generally now of the European community and the British government is working very positively, and we do appreciate that. We also asked and request them to continue exerting a lot of pressure because our battle is not yet over. It is not yet over. And the threat our sister there was raising is an imminent threat, and we need help, definitely. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you very much. I don't know whether you wanted to comment on the regional countries as well as the, uh, uh, yes, the Western the, government. The regional countries, uh, let, let me start with the most dangerous one, which is Egypt. Uh, Egypt will never, will never tolerate a kind of a democratic state in the, in the area, particularly a neighboring one like Sudan. It's always a threat for them because Egypt has never been ruled democratically. It has been ruled since I was born. That's 1952, <laughs> was born, uh, was ruled by military people. And uh, uh, a democracy for them is a threat for this kind of mentality. Uh, I think it is, it's only with the exception of a few years, maybe a year or two for Morsi, the deposed. Uh, and uh, the issue here is, is, is an issue of uh, for Egypt, there are other interests, and there are, they have there, it's, it's a pact. And I want just, actually because of the time, I wanted to speak about the, the policy of pacts which this regime involved us in. The most dangerous one now we're in, as I said, is the Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates are the ones now fueling all the problem and trying to hold or to stop our revolution. So other, other, other countries, we, we are also surrounded by the other one, Turkey, Qatar, the side. Uh, they're also, so it, it is putting Sudan in a very awkward situation. This is the policies of Bashir, and I don't think those people are moving because Burhan is the illegitimate son of Saudi Arabia. I don't think he, he will uh, disobey them. Well, thank you very much. I, I could, could I just, uh, just picking up one point you made, Abdul Malik, um, uh, I'm certainly, uh, I personally a, have been a critic of the Khartoum process, but I think it is fair to note the European Union did publicly deny that they were providing funding to the Rapid Support Force, although they were, of course, aware that Bashir was using the Rapid Support Force as his main instrument in terms of trying to control irregular migration. But I should just put that on the record. But just with regard to the EU, that recently we had a, a, a meeting this week, actually. It has been very positive um, about their... Um, you know, they believe about the transition, uh, uh, transitional government, and they are supporting. So there is a lot of positive hints coming at the moment. Mm. Well, I think we've seen the European Union, the, uh, Federica Mogherini, the high representative, making an extremely clear statement to the European Parliament on the 16th of, of April that the European Union would not recognize uh, the, uh, transitional, the, mili the transitional military council and was uh, pressing very hard to, for swift transition to a civilian-led government. So I think that uh, should certainly be recognized as a very positive um, shift in the European Union position. Thank you. So I'll take some more questions now. This gentleman over here. Hello. It's working? OK. Thank you very much. My name is Jihad Mashamon, and I'm a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Arab Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. I'd like you all to thank you all for your contribution. Yes, I just have a question and a clarification. Maybe I'll start with a clear clarification first. It's regarding Egypt's interest in Sudan. According to one source I talked to in Egypt, and he's from the military, 
He told me the real reason why they're not interested in to have uh, anyone being in control in Sudan is because they don't want an Islamist takeover. That's one. And of course, they're interested more of their, wa their Nile, the Nile water agreement. It's much more interesting for, I mean, from my point of view, I think that's much more interesting for the Egyptians than to counter democracy in Sudan, if I may say. And the second part is a question I have, which is as follows. Given that Hameti is well armed already, and that he's in power with the opposition, agreed to have him as a partner in the transition? That's a general question for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ian? Yes. Uh, Ian Cliff, former ambassador to Sudan, and uh, 20 years before that first secretary, the last time there was an intifada and a transitional military council. <laughs> um, and I'd just like to say how proud I feel of what the Sudanese people have achieved very much on their own this time round. But could I ask the members of the panel a question? Because it seems to me from everything that's been said here, absolutely crucial to what happens now is the relationship between uh, the civilians who made the revolution, the professional associations, the political parties, and the military. And a lot of negative things have been said about the, the military, and I understand we're talking about a very politicized military now. It's very different from uh, Taj ad din and Salah al-Dahab in 1985. But what do the members of the panel think, what would they like to see as the relationship now going forward between the military and civilians? Because you need the military to deal with all the, 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 the different armed elements that are part of the uh, Sudanese body politic at the moment, both on the opposition side and Mr. Hameti and his friends as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, please, here. Yeah. No? Thank you. Uh, my name is Yahya al-Bashir, uh, Sudan National uh, Liberation uh, Movement, uh, mainly uh, therefore. Uh, the speak uh, is very good, but I just want to uh, highlight something and also some questions. Uh, we have, since 30 years, uh, uh, peace without uh, democracy, which is mean uh, that which has been signed in Nifasha uh, 2005 and also Avoja and Doha and so and so and so forth. And now we have uh, new situations uh, in Sudan. And therefore, is the uh, elephant in the rooms. The, the regime head wanted by the ICC and also uh, the others also uh, in the lines as well. So the, the question is, how can you uh, make uh, democracy uh, with, be, with peace, especially in the transition uh, time? How can to make, for example, Darfur, now we have uh, millions of IDPs, refugees, and uh, very, very catastrophic uh, situations. How can to make it fit in the transition uh, government with really, really, uh, real representatives. And as far as I can see now, even in the uh, freedom and change uh, allies and other allies, I didn't see any representations for the Darfurian uh, people. And this will lead us not to repeat the mistake of the neighboring countries, but even our previous mistakes in 19. Uh, 85, when the transition government met without SPLM, and we have democracy without SPLM, and the war is continuous on and on and on. How can we avoid that situation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, I think we, we have four questions here. Um, one to all the panelists, which is uh, about um, the, the uh, relations between the various elements in the forces for freedom and change and what sort of role you'd like to see for the military. Um, we have another one about Egypt and whether its main concerns are <coughs> um, 
avoiding an Islamist takeover and also the, related to the Nile waters issue, uh, is Himiti acceptable as a partner in transition? And then finally, the question of the representation of Darfur and the marginalized areas in the forces for freedom and change and how that whole issue of the, of the conflict zones and the marginalized areas is going to be handled. Um, Dr. Sarah, could I, uh, could I ask the panelists to sort of answer whichever of those questions? We need to cover them all, but if you, could, yeah. you don't have to, Dr. Sarah, cover all of them if you would, if you'd like to start. I'm going to answer Mr. Cliff, if that's okay, about the, uh, the army. Uh, I'm not sure whether I was clear on my speech, but uh, what we have said that we would like the army and the police forces to continue their role as an independent institution. Uh, we value their role. This is why on the 6th of April, um, the Sudanese people moved to the uh, headquarters in front of the army, um, you know, to, to, to remind them about what happened in 1985 and to call them to join. So it's not hate. It's about, we, we, we believe that it's about the senior officers who are pro-government, who are blocking the way forward. But the middle ranks and the lower ranks are actually not happy with the regime. They have suffered the same way the uh, education has suffered, health services have suffered, and uh, new militias and new forces have emerged, uh, to, and actually they have been downgraded. So we still believe that among this group, there are people who will uh, hopefully support the transition if we can get rid of the uh, senior officers who are pro-government. Uh, we don't, we, we obviously, as I said, we want a, um, an independent uh, organizations and institutions. We want the National Intelligence Service to work as an intelligence service, gathering information, but not to practice what they are practicing at the moment. We don't want any militias. And the role of the army, if it's uh, uh, monitored and regulated, should play a major role in peace keeping and, and, and that's a, a, a very important part. So no, there is no hate. Uh, actually, we, we believe that there are uh, officers who are uh, pro uh, the revolution and the Sudan uprising. Thank you very much. Ali, could I ask you to, to tackle some of those? Yeah, well, I, I think I'll probably touch on the same kind of question because it, it kind of came up a couple of times and I think it's important to kind of um, 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 turn the other side of the, of the question, because it is true that um, I think we live in a revolutionary situation. Um, um, I will find it very difficult to kind of um, analyze what happened since, since the 6th of um, April as, um, as, as kind of clear forces um, coming together in order to achieve a revolution. I think there are various factors that played on that moment, and it's, it's still playing on this moment. I mean, there is obviously the, the people on the streets, um, 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 an impossible force that nobody is able to deal with. Um, and that's why the revolution has gone as far as it has, it, has, it has come. The issue for me is that we have, if one is talking about the people, you have ended up, as a result of what happened on the, on the 11th of April, with, with, with people who may, you may not like, you may not actually want to be a partner with, but actually they share a common, a common interest. Um, and I believe that um, after, the, after the dismissal uh, of Abnaouf, we have a question that the revolutionary forces have to answer, which is that um, um, who in the army and who amongst the people in the, in, the, uh, in the military council who's actually could be a partner. And I think the question is so important because obviously we all come to this moment because um, um, the people have effected a revolutionary moment that has actually brought these people together. Uh, Burhan, Hemeti, and the rest of them are actually are there because of what the people have done. They are actually now in command of the army. They run the country because of the revolution, not because anybody appointed any of them. And I think there is an argument that, uh, that, that we have to make as, as revolutionary forces, which is really you can't proceed any further without having to decide on that question. Who in the military council, who is in the army now who is willing to go the distance with, uh, with the revolution? And I think really that's the question that needs answering. Thank you. Did you want to comment also on the question of inclusion of 
the issue of Darfur and yes, from I mean, your I think perspective of uh, from the armed movements? Absolutely. From the armed movement perspective, of course, we are out of the discussion that is going on now inside Khartoum. Uh, and you rightly pointed out that actually there is no, there don't seem to be um, 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 uh, a foothold for the for the, either the armed movement or any representative of the marginalized community. I mean, I think that's a temporary situation. Part of the reason why we have decided, at least the leadership of the SPLM, to go actually to go, to go inside is because we believe that you have to be there to be able to uh, kind of push for what you want. And hopefully, they're not, I mean, it's not just the SPLM, actually, there is, there is a whole group of, from the revolutionary um, 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 forces, you know, therefore armed groups as well, representative of, of them are going. So we'll see what happens when, when we're there. But I think there is a room for, uh, uh, and I think that discussion have to be have to be sort of forced, which is that are the armed groups going to be part of the arrangement, the transition arrangements? Because we don't want to go back to having a government and then coming to negotiate with us about, you know, which is what you pointed to. That's just a failed formula. I think the armed groups have to be part of the transitional arrangement. Uh, we have made it clear that we're not interested, probably, in uh, some of those uh, um, um, uh, some of those bodies. Whether it is the uh, government, probably we're not. But you know, but we certainly would look at the look at the state council and the. Um, and naturally, of course, the Legislative Assembly. But th those are matters that have to be discussed, and, but we keen whatever foothold we have that we want to use in order to make peace part of the, the dual package of, of uh, peace and democratic transformation. Thank you. Do you want to comment on, on any of those questions? Uh, I think there was a question about Egypt's interests, which perhaps may oh, yeah. go a little bit beyond what you said before, particularly oh, referring yeah. okay. to Islamist, uh, a possible Islamist takeover and the question of the Nile waters. Yeah, um, I'm, I, I believe e Egypt or Egyptian people are in, in a very great dilemma. The dilemma of choosing between two evils. The, the one is a military, which are always dictatorship and fanatism, which is Muslim Brotherhood, is an exponent of that. And uh, I believe uh, it's not a choice for, for those people. As in terms of their relationship to Sudan, Egypt has never ceased to intervene in Sudan's life, ever, since independence or even before. They're always, all those kind of military coup, all those things, they're always tampering with these things and making life very difficult for Sudanese people because they believe that there is nothing called Sudan. It is it's actually a, a back garden of Egypt. It is, it is theirs, which is a, a kind of a wrong idea. They need by now to change that. Sudan is a sovereign country and has its own people, their own will, and so on. So. Um, if we look at the share in terms of water, Sudan offers almost half its share of the Nile water to Egypt free. Uh, in terms of the political struggle now between the two countries at the level of regimes, yeah, you, you can see al-Bashir has been always tossing here and there. He's going there and going against himself at one time. So he stands with the Ethiopian, and sometimes it's for political problems. But people need to sit. All the Nile-based um, countries need to sit and revise the the, uh, the the water treaty and 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 solve it in a way that helps all people to live uh, and to coexist friendly together. But uh, I, I think the other thing is, yes, Sudan. Uh, for some time has been harboring, or the regime has been harboring, all kind of terrorists, and um, enemies also of the e Egyptian regime, which is uh, now, he, he, this is why he wants, he doesn't want Muslim brothers, he wants military people. So it, it will help him do, do both. That's for Sisi, the, the president of Egypt. So uh, I hope that's answered your question. 
you want to say something? I more? just want to say to Yahya, uh, Yahya Bashir that definitely the full representation is important and in inclusion and uh, there should be no exclusion and this is something that people always will call for. Um, so we cannot move forward with, with excluding any party and this revolution is the people revolution so it, it is actually by the people of Sudan so everybody has the same share. Um, generally about Egypt uh, and, and the future, uh, I think between people of Sudan, people of, of Egypt, there is no, no problem at all. And in the region, I think everybody is very proud of what's happened in Sudan. Uh, the dilemma about the regimes and, and uh, what's happening, I think it comes to the fact that um, a, a peaceful resistance, a democratic change is something that will not be welcomed easily and not be digested, and we all know that. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm just going to take just a, uh, a very last, uh, a last round very quickly. There's a gentleman in the front row who's been trying to get my attention. Perhaps we can go there. Here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosaline, and thank you, the speakers. I am the ambassador of Ethiopia to UK. My name is Ambassador Fisaha. Uh, we have to appreciate in the first place the position of the African Union that set the tone on how to approach the issue of Sudan. And EU is no different. And we have to stick to that position. And the issue is among Sudanese. And we have to appreciate the negotiations but it is full of problems, full of challenges. The more the crisis continues, we are moving to uncharted territory, where both the possibilities of democracy coming into play and complete chaos coming in like the other Middle Eastern countries is in front of us. Uh, I have a little view on the approach to Egypt and on the Nile. Uh, that is manageable, provided that Sudanese come out of the crisis by themselves. But external support has to be to facilitate the mediation, the negotiation, and to expedite and to give encouragement to uh, amicable solution. Uh, but what has happened in Ethiopia and what's happening now in Sudan is a positive change, including the relation between Ethiopia and Eritrea improvement. That is something positive blowing over the region. But the challenge is, if past history is any lesson, civilian governments in, in, in Sudan have got their own challenges. All right? And the military, the same. And it is the first time we have seen such deeper crisis between the civilian and the military alliance in Sudan for the last 50, 60 years. But now, the challenge is the democratic forces themselves are diverse and are full of problems themselves in relation to each other. If we say, see Ali, SPLM North has to go to solve its own problems in relation to what come out of the, the negotiation between Sudan and South Sudan. Still you are SPLM, right? And Malik versus Hilu, yes, there is some sort of solution. But I think there is something that you have to do with the, the central government with Sudan. There is some solution we are expecting. And Communist Party, I don't know your position now as to your contribution. Because you have got Islamists, it is a fact. You have got communists here, it is a fact. And you can imagine the differences in their positions. And so what I want to say is that we have to encourage Sudanese to come out of uh, this problem by themselves. Uh, so the critical issue is how far you are able to manage your issues in, 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 your, in your negotiations. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, um, Peter. Just, just, just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Peter Everington, as a teacher in Khartoum Secondary School in the 1960s, I witnessed the first intifada 
and I would echo the awe expressed, the courage of, and resolution of the Sudanese people in this present time. Uh, in every class, I came to realize in, in the school there was a, a core group of committed communists and a core group of Muslim brothers. Both of them wanted to change the world. Hats off to them. And uh, the communists, if I'm right, inspired Numeri's takeover, just as the Muslim Brothers inspired Bashir's takeover. So I'm interested to know, perhaps in relation to the SPLM also, which was founded on Leninist, Marxist-Leninist principles, uh, how the thinking of communism has evolved as you address this bold democratic <laughs> experiment together. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have a question? Yes, the gentleman on the back row. Uh, my name is Jean-Emile Jamin, a uh, documentary filmmaker. I just want to know from the panel um, how important you felt uh, the role of the diaspora Sudanese community was in the events just leading up to April. Uh, if you could provide some anecdotal um, examples. Good, thank you. Um, well, I think we, we, perhaps I can just ask the panel now to respond to the, we had, I think, a very help, helpful comment from the Ambassador of Ethiopia. Could you respond to the questions and <clears throat> in any way, and then I think we must move to the next um, yeah, session. Uh, yeah, okay. Do you want me to start? Why not? Okay. So, I, I think the ambassador and my colleague, the teacher there, I was a teacher as well in Sudan. Um, they, they both touched on certain things. It, we, we're talking about tolerance. In reality, we're talking about being different and being also together, and that is something, and I do take your point, and this is very important. It is a fact that um, democracy d doesn't mean that we, we should stop, we have to be the same. We, we, we should be different and we should accept each other. And the history, well, in Sudan has lots of ups and downs. Sometimes people are wrong, not because they're wrong, but because they don't accept each other, and that is, that's wrong. The Communist Party has never advocated a, a single party system. It has been more of like a, a Euro communism in, in the sense that, and that was a great difference between the Communist Party and the Eastern Bloc before, long ago, uh, because we don't believe in a one party system. It is strong. Because in Sudan, with all its diversity, no one political party can solve all the problems, but we can solve the problem if we sit and accept each other in a kind of a system whereby we all observe the rules and recognize the right of others to be different. Yes, um, historically, yes, Muslim brothers and communists at the schools and so on, and at school, normally people at school become very hot and, and you see, full of energy, of fighting, and, and they take things either or, which is wrong, definitely. But I think in the experience of the Communist Party during the October Revolution, the communists and the Muslim brothers, they were in one, one kind of a front, fighting Abud. They were in the same. So I think in, in, in the traditions of Sudanese people, there is a room for tolerance, except when it comes to a kind of fanatism that actually filtered with the Nile backward from Egypt and from Saudi Arabia. If we could get rid of those two, we don't have a problem. We have a kind of Islam, Islamic version, which is very tolerant, very easy to go with, and people accept each other without much differences. And nobody wants to kill another, but we've seen people killed here, nailed. Without, it's just like what you can see with ISIS. That's one thing. Democracy is important. We need to, to do that. So I, I hope uh, I answered your question. There, there are differences, and people will not stop having differences and struggles. 
but it is the way we settle these differences. And that also brings me to the question of the military. The military used to support all revolutions from October to the second one, but this one, because the army nature changed. It's changed because of the people who made the, organized the military coup actually got rid of so many people and put their own people. So it is now diff very difficult to have this kind of a, an easygoing revolution like what happened before. It's not that easy. It's going to take a long, long time, but it will definitely come to an end and we'll see, hopefully, ourselves safely to the other side. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. Did you want to say So, so um, Your Excellency, I agree with you. There are challenges, um, and that is expected after 30 years of, uh, of oppression. Uh, so the transitional period, the, the four years, is not just for reconstruction and rebuilding of schools and hospitals. It's about reconstruction and rebuilding of politique, of academia, of all of these parts, and that will include the, what's happening in Sudan so that people, by the end of the four year, will be ready for a democratic uh, uh, election. We are aware of that, but we will appreciate the help of our uh, brothers and sisters um, in uh, different areas. Um, I think when we, we talked about uh, Mr. Peter Everton, um, the freedom of expression that you have witnessed, we have not been, we have not, I have not uh, practiced that since I, you know, in, in, in you know, school or university. And that's a, a healthy uh, way that we are looking for, though, that people can express their, whether they are Islamists or, or communists. Um, so I, I think uh, we are aware of the challenges. Um, it's not going to be easy. But uh, we are willing to work together, and we are willing to, to take over. The professionals are, are, are going to be regulators and monitors, so they're not going to be part of the uh, sort of the executive committee or of the uh, uh, ministers and stuff like that. So. Thank you. Uh, Ali, one final word? I guess just on the point of the, the, the um, SPLM is uh, Marxist-Leninist, you see? <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, yes, I mean, the, the SPLM is a broad church. I mean, we have had, um, um, we have had, um, um, yes, Marxists in it. I mean, you know, well-known um, um, sort of Southern Sudanese Marxists. Um, um, our own deputy chair was, uh, had a history in the Communist Party. So, but it is, we also got liberals, we've got, you know, I mean, you can see what's going on in Southern Sudan. That gives you a fair idea that actually there is no um, governing ideology behind the, uh, but like all liberation movements, it, it contains all kind of currents. But for my own thinking, I believe that um, I would like to call ourselves social democrats, um, um, an African version of social democracy. We would like to see that in Sudan, um, 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 a market that's being, you know, firmly controlled and um, and reined in by uh, by the government. So that's that's my own philosophy. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think time has come to say thank you very much to the, this panel for their contribution, um, which has been very, very helpful, and to invite our second group of three panelists to take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, great. Well, th we've now, um, I'm pleased to say, got three more very distinguished speakers to, who will bring a different perspective um, to, to these very important questions. Uh, if I could briefly just introduce our three panelists for this session, um, starting with, uh, on, the, on, on the far right, Nima Albagia, who is uh, a multi-award winning senior international correspondent for CNN, based in London. 
Uh, Nima has worked extensively um, in the Middle East and Africa um, and has been recognized for her uh, fearless reporting in some of the world's most dangerous regions. Um, Nima was born in Khartoum and has covered uh, Sudan on numerous occasions for CNN, um, most recently uh, leading the network's coverage on um, Sudan's pro-democracy protests and the ousting of um, uh, Omar al-Bashir. And I think she has also recently interviewed the head of the Sudanese Military Transitional Council, uh, General Abdul Fattah al-Burhan. Um, our, um, our second speaker in this panel is um, uh, Tanim Saeed, who is the chief executive officer of alsouk.com, um, Sudan's largest online classifieds business, and one of the most, uh, which is one of the most visited local internet platforms in the country. Um, Tanim is also head of strategy at uh, Saeed Industrial and Commercial Group, one of Sudan's uh, long-standing and reputable industrial cl conglomerates. Um, she is an executive director of the US Sudan Business Council and was previously uh, uh, a lawyer um, at Allen and Overy in London. And then our third speaker, um, Ihab Ibrahim Osman is chairman of the US Sudan Business Council and the general manager of NADEC New Businesses, which is one of the largest vertically integrated dairy companies in the world. Previously, he was uh, CEO of Sudatel Telecom and he's worked for Kuwait Finance House Bahrain and Verizon Communications in the, U in the United States. Um, and he serves on a number of corporate and non-profit boards, including the steering committee of the UN Global Compact Business for Peace, and also of the Khartoum uh, Breast Cancer Center Hospital. So, um, Nima, I think, would you like to uh, yes. start off? Nima has very recently come back from Khartoum, so we're very much looking yeah. forward to hearing your first-hand uh, impressions of the situation on the ground. Yeah, yes, which is why I feel like I should preface everything I say by the fact that I probably have slightly caught revolution fever. <laughs> it's, in fact, I mean, you could literally still hear it in my voice because any time you go into the, um, into the Merdan, to the sit-in site, it, it feels like you've stepped into another world. And in a lot of ways, being both Sudanese but also having covered so many of the uprisings that made up the Arab Spring, it was extraordinary to, to be there and see it firsthand because you could, you could see the ways in which Sudan's version, you know, the North African Spring, as many people are, are hoping that this Algeria and now Sudan and, and the, the saddest situation that's happening in Libya, um, how it has built on that mosaic, has very much learnt from what came before it, often in real time. When Sudan, when the demonstrations in Sudan started, you then had the demonstrations in Algeria and you, you had the demonstrators in Algeria holding up placards that mirrored a lot of what the Sudanese were saying on the streets and mirrored a lot of the Sudanese Arabic language. And, and that was very much almost instantaneous and very organic. At the same time, when you speak to a lot of the, the leaders of the, the demonstrations, there were also le lessons that they very consciously had learned, whether it was from Egypt about not leaving the demonstration site too soon which is what we're seeing now as they prepare to fast Ramadan. We're already, a lot of the leaders of the demonstrations that we were speaking to have been talking about the, the vast number of donations that they've received, the Ramadan tents, the, the preparations down to a very granular level about the shifts, the timing of the night shift and the day shift. But at the same time, I think there are things about this demonstration that were very uniquely Sudanese and were very uniquely, ironically, a product of Bashir Sudan, because the demographics here, the demographics in Sudan mean that this was, because most of Sudan is predominantly under 30, this, de this movement was led by those under 30, and very much in a conscious refusal of the conservatism that was engendered by the Islamists. It was also very much female-led. And I have to say, I'm embarrassed to admit, uh, as a 40-year-old woman, that I st found it startling every single night when we would leave at 1, 2 in the morning to see young, unmarried women manning the barricades, doing the searches themselves, and being very, not just unapologetic, but um, unsurprised 
by the fact that they had earned their presence there, even though it was very clear early on that the, the, the government forces had banked on that conservatism within Sudanese society. Um, one of the things that we heard a lot of was Aksir al-Banat, break the girls, because if you break the girls, you'll break the men. And the front, rows, the front rows were predominantly and consistently made up of women. And I, it'll be very interesting to see the impact that that has on Sudanese society and whether that can undo those 30 years of conservatism. The question that I think the gentleman in the front row made very, very well was, how is that movement now going to deal with the fact that it is Khartoum-centric? and the fact that its strength was in being Khartoum-centric, because these were the, the children of people that mattered. And while the government was very comfortable in killing the young people in Adbara, in Darfur, in the Nuba Mountains, unfortunately, the reality is they were less comfortable killing the young people who came from families in Khartoum. How are those young people who are a product of that culture and that riverine and that Khartoum-centric culture going to deal with inclusion? How are they going to deal with the legacies of Darfur? And the reality, an unpopular reality, speaking to a lot of those people on the ground, is the rapid support forces in Hamadi are acceptable. They may not be acceptable to the elite. They may not be acceptable to the older generation. But to people who sat there in the demonstration site and knew that the, the reality for them between life and death was whether or not the rapid support forces took their side. Hemeti is acceptable, and I think that is now going to be, that's going to be the fight for the, the heart and soul of this movement moving forward. I think for not just me, but for everybody in the international press covering this, what has been surprising has been the level of political sophistication coming from a generation that has been intentionally isolated. They knew how to respond to the Sudanese government's use of private Russian contractors to block uh, social media platforms. They knew how to very quickly deploy VPNs because they'd been using VPNs to access websites that were blocked for slightly more frivolous reasons by the government for the last decade or so, right? So they knew how to respond to that very quickly. I was amazed as somebody who's operated in Syria or in countries where you know that you're under a lot of scrutiny to actually have a 17-year-old say to me, this is the, the, the megabyte weight of WhatsApp. When you download it in Sudan, it will increase by 10 megabytes because they're going to try and put in a Trojan horse. So whatever it tells you, do not wipe your WhatsApp here while you're in Sudan, even if you think it's been compromised. It has not. That is an extraordinary level of sophistication for, for people who are struggling just for basic access. And I think the question that the international community, whether it's us as journalists, or the international community, the NGOs, regional and international bodies are going to have to face, is what do you value more? Do you value the Sudanese military's role in blocking illegal migration? Do you value the fact that the Sudanese um, infrastructure of oppression, the National Intelligence Service, has been incredibly effective as a counter-terror partner? Do you, as the United States, value the fact that the Sudanese government, even now in its entity as the military council, is willing to give you a political win in the person of negotiating for um, compensation for the families of the USS Cole and the East Africa bombing victims? Is that what you value, or do you value the very incredibly messy, disruptive process of an actual democracy taking root in a part of the world that will have an impact for regional uh, actors that matter, whether it's Ethiopia, which is dealing with its own internal tremors, is it fair to say, ambassador, at the moment, or whether Egypt that is very concerned about the contagion effect, because Egypt and Sudan culturally are so close that the contagion is a, it's a rational concern. It is a rational concern. I was stuck in Egypt for two days because they blocked airspace. That's how concerned they were. When I handed over my British passport, someone in national security helpfully said to me, but it says born in Khartoum. And I said, well, uh, OK, well, we'll discuss that with the British ambassador when he comes. Luckily, I was let in. But I just, I think the one thing I really hope that we manage to communicate here tonight is that there is an incredible amount of optimism. And there is good reason for optimism right now in Sudan. And the one message that we kept hearing again and again from everybody at that demonstration site was, we can do this. 
And if you can't help us, don't hinder us. Well, I think that's a very good note to, uh, to finish your, your remarks on, Nima. Thank you very much. Um, Tony, can I turn to you? Sure, thank you. So thank you all for being here today. Um, actually, I am going to set the scene a little bit by talking about economically what's been happening over the past period and where the business community is coming out on this, on the political issues uh, uh, to date. I have my colleagues actually then going to talk a little bit more about the sort of more forward-looking uh, view on, on where we can go from here. So, you know, I really am very delighted to see how many of you are here today. It's been a very long time since Sudan has commanded this much interest. Um, I think that's very positive. So, I, as I said, I'm just going to share my experiences as a business person in Sudan, um, in particular what we've really seen over the last year. So 2018 was really an incredibly tough year. The economy was in absolute freefall, the SDG was tanking, and the political situation was so unstable as to be actually ludicrous at times. You know, looking back now, it's very clear to see that actually we were pretty much at the end of the, of the NCP regime. Um, you know, the country was broke and they'd sort of burnt all their bridges with their friends. We weren't going to get any more cash. You know, from a business perspective, really every day brought its own challenges. Every day there was another fire to, to put out. You know, from my family's um, FMCG business perspective, one of the things we had to deal with was the hyperinflationary environment. And this really, I mean, one thing it meant that we had to recost our food products every day. This was absolutely horrendous to deal with. Uh, and many times we had to actually stop sales because if we didn't stop sales, there'd be unwanted arbitrage in the market of our own products. You know, if you looked at our mining or agriculture uh, businesses, there was a whole load of other problems there. The biggest one was the lack of diesel. There was no diesel, especially in remote places in the country. Um, you know, and if you combine that with the kind of endemic corruption and, and competence that seemed to take place at all levels of the NCP government, it just made um, doing business anywhere in the country an absolute nightmare. So I'm just going to, uh, did we manage to get the screen up? Okay, okay cool. I, I'm just going to um, have a screen brought up, okay, cool, you can see it, which just shows actually, I, I hope this is interesting, but it's basically, so this is uh, the users of elsuk.com, which is our online classifieds platform. And the reason I put this up is, so elsuk.com is basically a space online where people buy and trade. Okay, so in many senses, it's actually a barometer of economic activity in Sudan. Um, and, you know, it, we, we really saw exactly what was happening in the economy being reflected in the numbers online, which I thought was really interesting. So, you know, you can see what happened after Atbara, after the people of Atbara came out. You can see how the effect of the, of the um, April 6th set-in has impacted the economy. So, you know, at, at times, really, over the past year, things have been absolutely impossible. Uh, you know, just one other example is one point we saw, and we continue to see, actually, a very big spread between the rate of cash and check because there's no cash left. There's no physical cash banknotes in the economy. So at some point, the spread was 25%. So imagine trying to operate in that environment. So all in all, the economic situation was completely unsustainable, and something had to give. And it did give. You know, the, on 19th of December, the people of Atbar came out. Um, and soon after that, in the online space, we really saw the SPA, Professional Association, having a really strong online presence. Um, you know, with their inspirational slogans, their chants, they really seem to appeal to, across the country to, to the Sudanese people. Um, and, they, you know, the people really saw responded to their calls for, for peaceful protest and other forms of nonviolent resistance. So, you know, we got through, so this is now where, December. So December, January, February, March was an absolutely fascinating time in Sudan. Um, you know, if you were in Khartoum, the RSF, the NCP militias, the popular defense, the army, it was like everywhere you turned, there were armed men on the street. Um, and it created a real sense of tension and unrest, actually. And on top of all of that, of course, you had then the cause of all of this, which was the protests that were breaking out every day, or, and most nights, actually. And it was very interesting with the protests because it was the same pattern, small, scattered, but consistent. They never stopped, no matter what the NCP regime did. You know, um, you know the, seeing the Janjaweed, the RSF in the streets of Khartoum was quite interesting. I actually, when they first appeared in Khartoum, I think many of us in the business community thought, oh, that's it. That's the end of the protest movement. Who's going to go up against the RSF? Um, but really, to my surprise, actually, the arrival of the RSF and the militias only really seemed to mobilize the people more. And particularly after you had the first few deaths of young protesters in December, in, when you had you know, the tales of atrocities, of, of violence, and, and you know, misconduct against boys and girls uh, who had been caught up in the protest movement, I really felt that triggered a sense of disgust, actually, amongst the, the community in Khartoum. And so instead of actually causing suppression, what happened is that this violence and misconduct actually triggered, you know, this, this sense of, of we have to fight this more. Um, 
so, you know, from the perspective of business, it really was very interesting. Again, m you know, many of us realized, I would say, across the business community that the regime had lost all legitimacy. But the question then became, well, what did we think was going to happen? I mean, so for many of us, we thought that the only way really to move forward was at the very least if Bashir was replaced. And that was kind of our hope. Well, hopefully they'll just replace Bashir at least. Um, but others, you know, closer to the regime, did really think the regime would survive this. I mean, it had survived for 30 years. It had survived rebellions across the country. You know, there was no reason to think this would, it would not survive this. Um, but definitely, definitely, to try business during this time from December has been chaos. The lack of foreign currency, the lack of physical cash, the lack of diesel and even petrol, uh, you know, the panic of the Bashir regime. With it. They kept chopping and changing ministers, they, the too, far too frequent issuance of laws and regulations. It all just cost, contributed to a total and utter crashing economic situation. And then came April 6th and the sit-in. And from a business perspective, this has a really been a really, really interesting month. You know, we brought a, it's brought us a whole new set of challenges. Um, you know, for one, the, the blockades that the SPA has erected across the city have basically brought the transport of goods and services to a halt. Uh, obviously, this is very important for the SPA and for, the, for its allies um, and for the forces of freedom and change in general because it's their strongest bargaining uh, chip against the, the military council. So, you know, for many of us in the business community, this, this has, you know, pushed us into a situation where we've been forced to reveal our colors, you can say. Are we pro or are we against the revolution? And if you're pro it, you must prove it with actions, not just words. You're expected to contribute to the sit-in and contribute to the protest movement in the form of goods, in the form of even just, you know, statements. So it's been very interesting to see who has, who has risen to that. Um, you know, the fall of the NCP regime has meant that many government offices, the heads have been taken away, so there's a paralysis also across the arms of the government, which is not great. But for many of us in the business community, really, this is kind of the price of what we hope will be a brighter future for Sudan. Um, you know, the, 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 the last 30 years have been, have been very, very difficult from a business perspective, actually, if you think about it. There have been peaks and, 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 uh, in the economy, but actually, if you look overall, it's not clear that Sudan has come out much stronger than where it started. Um, and I think many of us are really hopeful that this new Sudan means that finally, for one, we'll be able to throw off the nightmare state sponsor of terrorism designation, um, which has completely limited our access to global banking. I think that we're really keen to see you know, a new Sudan, which has, means an end to isolation, renewed FDI interest, debt relief, development support, all of these things are needed. You know, and with them will come things like the return of the diaspora, who have so many important skills and, and experience that we really need to, in Sudan right now. You know, the end of the divisive ideologies of, of divide and rule that the NCP have applied may also, I hope, lead to, to peace across the country, which means the opening up of markets that for the business community have been inaccessible for a very long period of time. So, you know, I know in business, often people think that the business community are very skeptical of times like this, that we will always stand behind the military uh, regime because we favor political stability. I think I just want to say that actually for many of us, you know, if the past 60 years experience across Africa have taught us anything, it's that actually military regimes may work in the short term to stabilize. But past that, they just don't seem to provide the stable, cohesive, open countries that we really need for a flourishing economy. And so we really hope that people will back people power at this time, because in our mind, really, this is maybe the only shot to really have a, a, the type of government that can allow Sudan to really and truly reach its economic potential. Uh, thank you, Chatham House, and uh, thank you especially to the Africa program team uh, at Chatham House. You've always been there for uh, the Sudanese people, and thank you for, the, for this opportunity. Uh, but most importantly, I want to thank the young people of Sudan um, for giving us this chance to finally get it right. Uh, a chance to create a Sudan that works for all of us, um, regardless of origin, gender, race, color, religion, um, age, any designation you can think of. Um, a chance to create the United States of Sudan. Um, which could easily become an African economic powerhouse uh, that is well-governed, dynamic, open, inclusive, fair, 
and hopefully almost free of corruption. Um, a USS that allows every Sudanese to live in dignity. If there was one word I can use to describe the 30 years of Bashir and the NCP is taking away our dignity as people. That allows us to live in dignity, to be free to dream, and to have real shot at achieving our full potential. Um, first, I just want to make one sentence about uh, the impasse that is happening uh, between the DFC and uh, TMC today. And I hope both sides will keep this in mind. In negotiation theory, there is something called the BATNA, um, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which is essentially the position you should know um, or what you will fall to if you do not arrive at an agreement. And I hope both sides keep that in mind because there are at least 40 million lives at stake. So going into the economy, I, I want to talk kind of looking to the future and the economy of Sudan and try to look just quickly in kind of short term, medium term, and, and long term um, what we believe uh, what I believe needs to happen. And, and by the way, anything I say here, it's absolutely my personal uh, point of view, so not representing any, um, any organization uh, or anything like that. Um, first of all, we need to keep the machine running. We need to have bread, to have hopefully some banknotes, uh, some uh, fuel in the pumps, electricity going. So first thing, we need to make sure um, the machine uh, to keep running. We need very quickly and from the beginning set very high standards for governance and integrity for our new transitional government. And very quickly we need to start working on finding and controlling all the off-balance sheet companies and activities. This is the time, if we look back at the Soviet Union, when it disintegrated, lots of billionaires got created, and a lot of them live right here in London. Um, and this is the time when a lot of these assets um, that belong to all of us will disappear. And this regime had plenty of off-balance sheet companies and activities that if we do not try to find it and keep track of it very quickly, it will disappear. Um, what do I mean by off-balance sheet transactions? If you take, people always talk about how 70% of the government of Sudan is spent on security and defense. Go through that budget. You will not find a single line that says buy bullets or tear gas or an armored vehicle or a tank or any of this stuff. But I think this revolution have showed us how much tear gas and bullets this regime had. So clearly, it was being purchased some way and that was not reflected in the national budget of the country. And just, just to give you an idea, the kind of cash and money that has been floating within our system that is not reflected in any document. Um, we need to very quickly use international expert in forensic accounting to find all the leakages um, that are happening in our economy and stop them because this is where the corruption and where all the issues. When people talk about corruption, they only talk about regime icons. Believe me, corruption is a lot more um, than regime icons and there are significant corrupt organizations and individuals that are not necessarily card-carrying members of the NCP. So we need to look at all the major activities in the country with true forensic accounting to stop uh, these leakages. Gold, oil, 
um, subsidies, uh, all the things that have a lot of cash attached uh, to it. And we need to very quickly design and hopefully negotiate uh, with the international community an economic package that will give this transition government a chance to succeed and to take Sudan from this 30 years to hopefully a better and brighter future. So this short term I'm talking about, basically in the next six months. Um, medium term, kind of six to 18 months out, we need to start the restructuring process. Uh, there is a lot that needs to be um, uh, done in Sudan. Uh, when uh, al Inqaz, when the NCP came to power, one of the things they've done, they've destroyed completely all of the institutions of Sudan and started building it the way they believe Sudan should look like and completely cut us from our heritage uh, that was a relatively um, uh, decent civil service that to some extent functioned. Um, I think all the heritage of these 30 years needs to be pushed aside and reconstruction from scratch uh, and especially look at the technologies that are available in the world today that will enable us to truly build an economy that will be modern and work for the young people that uh, made this revolution happen. Um, in the long term, we need to prepare the environment for a private sector to lead the economy, but the private sector need to be regulated. We need an inclusive economy. We need an, in an economy that is equal so we do not have to suffer the inequality issues that we've seen over the last 30 years. I'm not calling at all to become communists, but we need to be socialist, and we need to make sure <laughs> <laughs> our people are taken care of, and we have to regulate the private sector, and the government should look out for the interest of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, may I um, now open the floor for questions to this uh, this panel? Um, yes, please. Hi, my name is Khuloud, and I work in the aid sector, but my question is not related to aid. My question to the panel is, now that we're moving towards the domestic scene in, in Sudan, how far and, and how long do you think these ostensibly unified interests of as Nyama, you said, the people of Sudan out in the Maidan. Excuse my voice, I also have revolutionary fever. <laughs> um, and the business interests, um, how far do you think they will be aligned and how long for? Because my sense is the protesters have more skin in the game. The business sector has suffered, but not nearly to the same extent. And, you know, the protesters are willing to go, you know, as long as it takes, as the fast Ramadan, etc. The business world has, is slightly better inoculated against these shocks, but also more interested in quick wins through immediate stability. And from what I've seen, actually, the longer and more protracted the demonstrations um, become, the more kind of, of the civic imaginary that takes place, the more the uh, democratic processes, you know, through the sit-ins, through the teach-ins, through the surveys, that's the stuff that really is always missing from very quickly um, done externally mediated political settlements and, and agreements. So actually we're seeing a lot of these things take shape, but my sense is that that may not necessarily be in the long-term interest of the business commu community. Excuse me. So to what extent do we think this so-called, so far, unified approach will, you know, remain? Thank you. And uh, just take this here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jill Lusk. I'm a journalist specializing in Sudan for many years. Um, it's wonderful to hear people being so positive, and I think that kind of positive attitude has characterized this amazing revolution, which has made many of us very happy. 
and congratulations again. Um, but people are talking now as if the government had been dismantled, the previous government. Um, Dame Roslyn previously made reference to the deep state. That state is very, very deep indeed. Um, been watching it for 30 years. It's extremely deep in every aspect. People have talked a lot about the military, but not much about the intelligence services on which the government was far more dependent than it was on the army. So um, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit and see, you know, um, Ali talked about dismantling it. I, what needs to be done? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, right over here. Uh, thank you. My name is Amir Mustafa. I'm director uh, at Minara Analytics, um, <clears throat> London-based consultancy. My question is actually for both this panel and the previous one. Um, how united is the um, coalition, uh, the alliance, in terms of their vision of future Sudan, uh, especially with respect to sovereignty, stability, and um, <coughs> uh, unity? of um, Sudan, um, and what are the non-negotiables that they all share with respect to these three items? And one very quick question to Nema. Um, you mentioned that the young uh, people who are leading this revolution, who are in the sitting, <coughs> who are sitting in, are very um, basically starry-eyed about Himeti. No, no, I didn't say the leaders of the thing. No, no, not the leaders, the, the, the young uh, some of those taking part yeah. in the demonstration. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. I, I, what, I get, what I get from the social media is that there is a fascination or a, an approval or acceptance of Hemeti. To what extent do you think that is going to continue once um, the other side or the other, other face of uh, Hemeti shows up, especially probably in the next few weeks once the patience runs out? Thank you. Good. Um, I think if we could perhaps um, look at that. Uh, I think we've had one, one question about um, how long will a united approach perhaps continue between the people and the business community if the protests were to go on for quite a long time. Um, something, we have a question about um, the deep state and particularly in relation to the intelligence service. Um, um, another question about how unified are the forces for freedom and change in, on questions of uh, sovereignty uh, and unity of Sudan and what are the non-negotiables. And then another fourth question about um, the way Himiti is regarded and his acceptability. And of course, one does have to perhaps distinguish between how he may be perceived by the protesters in Khartoum and how he's perceived in Darfur and the Nuba Mountains. And um, Nima, would you like to start on uh, any of those? Um, yes, I think they actually all overlap, um, which is time. Himeti, the way Himeti is perceived will change the more Himeti comes to the forefront of this. What was really interesting was that in the first few days, Himeti denies this. He says it's his brother. Protesters tell us it was him. Turned up with several hundred forces because clearly he himself had bought into this vision of himself as the hero of the, of the revolution and where the military council had failed to clear the city and he clearly thought that the rapid support forces could. Um, so he turned up and said, we're going to clean, we're going to clean up the, the sit-in site. And almost immediately a chant was taken up saying, why don't you focus on cleaning up the Islamists? We'll clean up the sit-in site when we're done. And the irreverence of the, and the disrespect that was thrown to him the moment he attempted to, to exert some of his newfound revolutionary heartthrob status. And, and actually, that is part of it. Some people are surprised that this person who they had thought of as this monster who lived out in the bush was actually perfectly acceptable looking. I think our bar is quite low for what acceptable looking is, but I, I will leave it there. Um, so I think all of these things depend on time. And, and I think part of what Khaloud was talking about with regards to the sensitization that is being done by the protesters themselves. And again, that is part of, of, of what this movement had to become to survive al-Bashir and his infrastructure of impression. It meant that there was never really any clear, clear singular leadership, because the clear singular leadership were always threatened and taken away. So it was consensus rule. It was community consensus through education and discussion. And we're seeing that with the way that the role of the rapid support forces is being um, 
sent out into the, into the demonstration. But at the same time, of course, the Rapid Support Forces, their uniform is very similar to what the armed forces wear. We were there on the last night, and there's a song, there's a very famous, nobody will know this, but there's a very famous Sudanese hip hop song that talks about the RSF as Janjaweed. And there were RSF soldiers being carried on the shoulders of protesters singing along to it. <laughs> So I think there's also a disconnect within the RSF of who they are. There is a moment that they're enjoying, which is that they are being glorified. And also, I think we have to differentiate between the officers in the lower levels who have not benefited from the gold and the, 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 the mercenary back pay that Sunni soldiers are being given in Yemen and who themselves don't understand how they're being seen. But it is all about time. How much time are the greater Sudanese public willing to give the, the demonstrators. In Egypt, it was, what, 18 days before the demonstrators in Tahrir Square came under a lot of pressure to give in and to give up and to trust the military. I think in Sudan, the difference is that we don't have a similar culture of trust for authority figures in general. Whatever small trust we had has been beaten out of us by the last 30 years of the, of the Islamist regime. I do think the issue is going to be the reality of the fact that whether it is coincidence or conspiracy, the, the faces have remained the same. We went to the presidential palace for our, our interview with Al Burhan, and I was met by the exact same person from the armed forces press office who I used to argue with vociferously um, to discuss what time my interview would be. And he still hadn't done the mental leap to understand that he was no longer the gatekeeper, that he had no control. In fact, we had a 15-minute argument that my older brother saved him from, because I was like, you couldn't stop Sudanese journalists from doing their job when you were a dictatorship. Do you think you're going to stop us now? And I think that you can't have a Ba'athist purge. It just doesn't work. Sudan is too interconnected familiarly, tribally, community-wise. We know it doesn't work because we saw what happened in Iraq. So what are we willing to sacrifice? We don't have the human capacity. We just don't. Our human capacity is the legacy of the Islamist state. So what are we willing to tolerate? And I think these are the questions that the demonstrators, the Sudanese Professionals Association, these are the questions that they're going to have to answer. Thank you. Do you want to come on down any other questions? Sure. I'll just... So just um the, let me explain the, the many business people's concern about the, the current standoff. And I know a few of you have touched on this idea of the, the forces of freedom and change not being united. The, the ambassador here mentioned it quite, quite a lot. I think one of the issues that we as, as a business community have noticed, or the people who perhaps sit a bit outside the, the, politic, the political sphere, is you know, this is very much a revolution driven by the SBA and the Civil Society Alliance. Okay, they are the ones who brought down the, this regime with the help of the military. It was not the other parties, it was not the other armed forces. They've been trying for 30 years and they failed. So the people on the street are very much listening to and guided by the SBA and, so, and their allies in civil society. And I think one of the concerns and one of the reasons why this whole process has become that much more complicated is because the, because of the nature of the SBA and because of and the Civil Society Alliance is that they, they want to be consensus-based and they want to allow room for everyone's opinions to be voiced, including those of the armed uh, rebels, including those of the, of the existing political parties, which is great because as and when it, we do achieve the civilian transitional government, it should be a consensus-based arrangement. But it does mean that at this time, what we are seeing is that everything is much slower because there are five pillars of the, of the FFC that have to approve everything. And many of these parties have not quite really accepted that actually the SBA and, and the Civil Society Alliance are probably the ones who should be leading the show because they're the ones who have most legitimacy right now. So that's kind of, I think, the way you know, sort of some of us in the business community are viewing this. Um, I'm just going to talk really quickly about this whole thing of the, the dismantlement of the, and the deep state. And Emma's points are totally and utterly right. You cannot have a purge simply because it's too entrenched all the way down. So if you start purging, you're going to purge away everything, and then we will end up in what many of our neighbors fear will be a civil, a civil war or worse. So you know, I think much of the approach that we've seen, especially from SBA, from civil society, has been very, very reasonable. Look, these people are there. You know, we couldn't deal with someone like Ibn Of, for example, and a few others on the military council. But actually, we have to accept that they are there, and we have to work with them to slowly, over the next 
two, four years, or whatever the transition, make changes to the way Sudan is governed. Um, but if you do it too hardcore now, you know, you, the Islamists are still the fundamental Islamists. The, the Muslim Brothers are around. They are armed. That's, they, they have the militias. They have you know, a strong network across the country. And they can always pull in allies such as Qatar or, or you know, other, other players in the region. So it's, it's not a good idea to go in you know, too harsh and try and pur purify any, anything right now. It has to be dealt with over time and gradually. Um, people and, and, and business, how, how united. I, I, I think business is a big word. There is a um, very small subset of business today in Sudan that I think we can call as truly independent and away from the old regime. And I think these businesses are very patient and because their interests are perfectly aligned with the interest of the people, uh, because they've also been relatively uh, marginalized, not like everyone else, of course, but relatively. And I think we'll be patient and we'll wait for no matter what it takes to get it right. Because when it get it right, they will be the first to benefit, actually. Uh, however, there is a lot of other businesses that are a lot closer uh, and part of that deep state. Um, that I think are getting very uh, uncomfortable and they want to get quickly to the next stage because they want to get back to business. Uh, and this is what we really need to focus on, on dismantling the deep state. It's the economic uh, straws. It's the, these economic veins um, of the old regime that if they were, if, if we were to leave them alone, they will continue to function and they will continue to feed this regime even if it's underground and we, we will never get rid of it. So the true deep state is an economic deep state and this is what we really have to aggressively go after if we were to kill the regime. Absolutely no purge. Islamists are part of the Sudanese uh, society. Now they're not all equal. Um, we have to be very careful. We cannot act like them, uh, uh, the bad uh, part of them. So we just have to make sure all Sudanese are included. Vision for a government or a unified uh, view of the government, we need a light government. We need a government that functions. We need a government that is actually um, is about transitioning and transforming the country. Why do we need a sovereignty council with 15 members? Why do we have to go back to the old? You need somebody from this region and that region and this region. Shouldn't the people, whoever is in charge, no matter where they are, actually build a system that will care for all of us, regardless of where we are? And if we assume a person from a region will do well for that region, then you can assume the people who are ruling Sudan should have done well for Sudan because they are Sudanese. So being from a region doesn't mean you're going to do well for that region. We need a system that will take care of all of us. And then you put people to run this system regardless of where they come from in Sudan. All right, thank you very much. Well, I think I've only got time for like a couple of questions. Um, can I take this one over? Yes, uh, Jana over here. Joanna Oyediran from Open Society Foundations. Um, this is an aside comment, but I find it absolutely fascinating and slightly disturbing how much we've talked about Hamaiti. Um, <laughs> but my question was um, there, that um, you mentioned, Nima, about the, the relatively narrow profile of people that you engaged with in, uh, around the military headquarters. But I, Khartoum is a big city, and there is Jabarona, there's Mbada, there's many other parts of... You know, all of Sudan is there. So I was wondering um, what you saw of the engagement of uh, people in other people from other areas of Khartoum beyond the elite in this process, and if you visited any other areas of where many marginalized people live. Thank you. And just behind you. Um, hi, my name is Hind. I'm a civil servant in the UK, but I'm speaking on, um, on a personal capacity as well. Um, so my question is about the transition and about timelines. I think this panel and the previous panel have kind of touched on taking our time and getting it right. 
but I really want to know what you would like to see in place and what controls or measures you'd like to see in place before there is a formal transition or before there are um, democratic elections. Um, I also just want to kind of, like four years I think has been mentioned and I just want to kind of get your opinions on what you think that would, how that would be received by the young people who have been demonstrating. Four years is a very long time. Um, for young people, it's life-changing, and I wonder how much urgency can be kind of placed on this in the interests of those who were protesting and who've been out there. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll have this one last one. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Very generous. <laughs> uh, my name is Abdul Azim Al Hassan from Sudan Research Group and a journalist and researcher. Um, we have been the 1964 and 1985. Uh, democracy has a very short life in Sudan. How can we ensure that in 2000, what's now, 2020, uh, after five years, we will not be uh, going to, into a revolution again? How can we sustain and maintain, um, give, uh, make sure that this time it lasts? My own personal, um, I think that the economy has a, a huge role to play. People come out of uh, dictatorship with very high expectations, and these expectations are frustrated, and then we have problem, political uh, conflicts. Um, what happens in 1985 is that we got the World Bank and the IMF pressing for very short run and very destructive policies, and while the people are now asking for peace and justice, how can we try build uh, a strategy for development based on the long run, based on peace, based on justice. It's not an economy. We are looking for uh, uh, a strategy for peace rather than short run structural reforms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, could I ask the panelists to um, yes. address these questions and if you could make this also any concluding remarks you wanted to make? Uh, yes. Um, to, so to jo Joanna's point, uh, What's really extraordinary visually about going to the sit-in site is it's the first time for me as a northern Sudanese to see every ethnicity, every tribe in one place. You just don't see that. You go to weddings, you go to funerals, you will see the odd person from a different region who went to university with somebody's cousin. But you never ever see a genuinely ethnically and racially mixed group of people in one place in Sudan. And the demonstration site is the only time I have ever seen that across all socioeconomic classes. So I was walking in and being flagged, flagged down by my mother's friends, while at the same time being flagged down by people who had gotten on the train from Adbara or come in from Umbadda. So I think that that is where the hope is that perhaps we are building a different Sudan because Yes, the faces that you see in the corridors of power continue to be very much northern, very much light-skinned, predominantly of Arab origin. But when you go to the sit-in site, even when you see not just the Sudanese Professionals Association, but every single other civil society actor that is represented at the sit-in site, and I don't even feel that it is conscious. It's not a moment of, hey, we've got a panel in, in an hour and somehow it's all white and male. No, this is genuine. Not this panel, not this panel. So this, this did feel genuinely like this is how this has organically grown because those who suffered the most were genuinely those from the regions and those from, from marginalized communities. That is not yet reflected in the corridors of power, unfortunately, but hopefully it means it will. Um, and to Hin's point about transition, uh, I think what I go back to again is this sense of political sophistication amongst those leading this movement. They are very clear about what they want to see with regards to a civil transition to power. They don't seem to have an expectation for that to happen overnight, nor do they have an expectation that that means necessarily us going to the polls overnight because nobody thinks that Sudan in any of its sectors, whether it's the business community or in the civil society sector, is ready for that. But they just want, they know what their goal is, and their goal is 
civilian rule. And actually, when you think about what their goal is, when you think about what they're willing to accept, it's not actually that dramatic. A hybrid council made up of a combination of civil and military actors, and in fact, the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Interior, you know, their sense is, we'll let the uniformed people hold on to that. It's not that dramatic, and I think that's why in the last few days, especially before we left, you could feel a change in the atmosphere at the sit-in site. It was always very polite, it was always very courteous, but it began to feel angrier because they didn't feel like they were asking for so much. And I think that that anger is what's going to sustain this movement, not in a dangerous way, but definitely in a way of maintaining the seriousness of this. What I would like to see, um, I'm not a politician, so I, I'm here purely as a journalist, but I think you cannot have a democracy without a strong and free press. And the fact that there has been even the remnants of journalism surviving in Sudan is extraordinary. And I think what's important to make clear is that even when the newspapers were shut down, even when the national intelligence agency summoned all the heads of the satellite channels and, and literally said to them verbatim, I had this from four different people, mention the demonstrations and we will burn down your channels. Sudanese journalists still found a way to report. They set up WhatsApp groups, they reported to social media, they reported to Facebook. That is amazing. And that is the kind of capacity that needs to be supported, it needs to be lauded, but it also needs to be nurtured. And I think in the, in the next few years, we need to understand, the same way we need to understand, to Ahab's point, what is corruption? I think in Sudan, we believe that corruption is somebody literally with their hands in the till. No, it's people benefiting off the public good. It's people making money off contracts that are not equally open to everyone. And for that education to continue, you need journalism and you need journalists. And I, I accept I'm not objective about this because I trained in Sudan. I'm the product of Sudanese journalists and I don't think I'm particularly special. There are thousands of better journalists than me working in Sudan today. They just really need the support and they need the opportunities. Sure, I'll just add to Nama's points about the, the diversity of the people participating in the protest movement. I mean, I'll tell you, we have factories in Wad Madani, and from day one, they were out on the street. <laughs> uh, the whole, every, everyone was. Um, and I consistently, you know, for me, I've been in Tehran over the past three months. It's not, you know, I haven't just gone into the city, and I've been sitting there watching everything and every day. And all of the protests had a mixture of people from across the political spectrum, from across the social spectrum. Uh, you know, the range even of age from, you know, sort of a five-year-old to a hundred-year-old. You saw everything. So it has been a very, very inclusive movement and a very special movement. And I really hope that that can continue because that's exactly the spirit that we need to rebuild Sudan and to go through, as someone mentioned, those painful economic reforms that are now needed. Um, so I will just caveat something. I can't remember which someone mentioned something about the IMF in the you know 80s and 90s, kind of cr cracking the whip. But it's a very different world today. I mean, can you imagine even 20 years ago the AU coming out with a statement saying you have 15 days to hand over to to civilian rule? I mean, 20 years ago it would have been okay. Well, bring him in. The new, <laughs> new dictator is going to join the club. So very, very different world. Different international organizations, very different IMF. I mean, even under the Bashir regime, the IMF was very keen always that any changes to the subsidies were matched with strong social safety nets. Um, you know, there was a whole poverty reduction strategy in place. So I really, I, I don't fear actually going forward at all in that sense. Um, I just want to touch on, on one thing, which is the, uh, well, two things actually. So one is this four-year issue because I feel like that's been very contentious. I think people were really shocked when they heard that the forces and freedom of change were asking for four years in transition. Again, this goes back to the, the concerns that they have around the deep state and preparing the country for elections so that the next set of elections are not hijacked. You know, from a business community perspective, you know, what can we say? Elections could be good or bad, put it that way. But, um, you know, at the very least, I think we all accept that you probably do need two years. To, to really stabilize the country and the economy, you probably do need two years. If it needs to go to four years, well, for a young person on the street, four years is a very long time. Um, you know, if you remember being sort of 18 or 20 years old, it's quite a long time. Uh, you know, each term is long. So, so I think that's, that's something that the, that the forces of freedom and change do need to bear in mind. Will their constituents, so to speak, uh, really, really stand this, this passage of time? 
Um, and the last thing I would say is a safeguard to this concern that, you know, that we may have, we may slip into dictatorship again or that we're not going to have democracy again. Or, sorry, that democracy will not stand and the democratic process will not come to be. I think it's just one really interesting that we, thing that we've seen is how much the Sudanese people have learned their own power in the past three months. They really, you know, really people power is just a, uh, such a strong force right now. And I think what you will actually see is that any time over the transitional period, the people feel that their revolution is slipping, I am hoping, and I, I, my sense is really, that they'll just come back out onto the streets again. So whoever is going to be in power is going to have to deal with that and face that reality. And again, the power of things like social media in this new modern age make a huge difference in, in how quickly that can be implemented. Thank you. I was just going to perhaps add a comment to what you said about the, the, the period before elections are held. I think the concern of many is that um, if you rush to elections, and I can see for many people that might sound like a good idea, if you do it before you've made some considerable inroads in dismantling the deep state, then there's a risk that the, uh, if you would have elections that are not really free and fair and that the old regime may then come back again through the ballot box and you'll be back to square one. And also one has to remember that over the last 30 years, the previous regime has systematically undermined and infiltrated the opposition parties who need to be given time to rebuild themselves and to reach out to their grassroots. So I think all these are factors that um, it's not for me to say how long the period should be, but I think one just needs to bear that in mind in a Sudanese context. You have. I'm 46. And uh, only in Sudan, I'm still considered a young person. So <laughs> I would like to see the transitional period finish before I turn 50, or even in Sudan, is considered old. Um, yeah, four years is probably too long. Um, I hope, I totally agree with Rosalind. Uh, we do need to dismantle the deep state, and it will take time. Uh, when is exactly um, the, the, the right? Uh, amount of time. I think we need to put specific targets and pillars uh, for that transitional um, or to transition to democracy. And as we achieve these targets, then that's probably the right time. And hopefully it will not be four years and we can do it less than that. So probably more than two and hopefully um, less than four. Uh, the only way to have sustainable democracy that hopefully will live more than uh, four years or five years or one term is to have a sustainable economy and a solid economy that works for every single one of the people in Sudan. And the way to build that, it's going to take a lot of effort and we have to have the right set of expectations. We have to manage expectations. I really feel um, in a way, sorry for the people who will be in the transitional government. They will probably see more demonstrations in this transitional period <laughs> than Bashir saw in the 30 years uh, because people have found their way to the street and it will happen and they have expectations. So managing these expectations is going to be the number one job, I think, for the transitional government. So the young people are not frustrated and even People who are about to become old like me are not frustrated. Um, it's going to be really challenge to, to manage this on the way to building that sustainable economy that hopefully will uh, build a sustainable democracy for Sudan. Well, I think um, there's, there's perhaps a once in a generation opportunity for change in Sudan now. And on past experience, I think we've seen Sudan having revolutions perhaps once every couple of decades. Well, I may not be around to see the next one, so I'm very keen <laughs> that you make a success of this one. So can I invite you just to thank the panel and thank you for being such a good audience. <laughs>